This is my mother's garden. Uh, when she's lived here over the past 30 years, she was only here for a few months a year and she didn't want things to grow here. She wanted to keep it simple. So this was all flat and it was covered with weed cloth and then pea gravel. And we had pondos and some sad oaks and little else on purpose. So in 2016, we began to change that. Um, first in the backyard, and then the backyard project grew to here. This happened because our clay sewer pipe busted and had to be replaced. So in trenching that open, we having learned from the backyard, built three bumps, one, two, three. We filled them with rocks and native plants. And it was like that, surrounded by pea gravel, until um, last May with um, the COVIDs and the Flagstaff Tour of Artful Gardens coinciding, we just got a, a wild yen to change it all up. And so we raked out the pea gravel. I say we, I helped, I had a crew. Um, we raked out the pea gravel, we added more elevations, and we brought in more rock and more material and planted more native plants. And this is what you have now. So first there were three big bumps and these are made out of composted Grand Canyon mule manure. <laughs> and that is coupled with OGC, organic ground cover on top, which holds water in and suppresses weeds. And then um, mixed into that are native rocks um, from around here. We were lucky that we had a lot of help with that from a dear friend who's a small equipment operator and brought us lots of rocks. Um, but these lumps happened because the sewer pipe had to be replaced. And like I said, then we decided um, the, this past May to bring it all together. Because all these native plants were desperately trying to come down below and there would be a little tiny fern bush or a little tiny penstemon or, you know, one little thing after another. But they were struggling through this pea gravel and it was sad. So for a couple of reasons, we decided to just go ahead and bring it all together and it's ended up being a really beautiful place for my mom to walk. So as I said, this is her garden, and now this is her walking loop through the native forest, and we just, we just love it. So it uses very little water, um, and we like that. Conserving water is really important where we live. We are high desert, and, but you can see it can be lush. You just have to grow things that don't mind living in high desert, and that's her native plants. It's very, very rewarding. Lovely. All right, so let's see. Then we put, of course, the flagstone and sand, and I'm trying to get all this ground cover just to mix all in. Eventually, I want this all just to be a green carpet, and this OGC eventually will just decompose and be covered by grasses and wildflowers and crawling, viney, creeping things. Um, and they sustain each other. They shade each other. They provide root system for one another, um, and all of them sustain our local pollinators. So we've planted lots of cherry trees for the swallowtail butterflies um, because this is the only plant that a swallowtail will lay its eggs upon because it is the only thing that baby swallowtail caterpillars can eat. Nice. And of course they that. can't go anywhere so they have to be hatched upon their food source. So we have native cherry trees all around the yard. This is our finest example. It actually has little cherries on it that the birds like, not for people. Um, and the other important plant for pollinators is milkweed, and that's because monarch butterflies will only lay their eggs on milkweed for the same reason. And it's a little known fact that monarchs come through this town, rarely, but they do, and not in great numbers, but when they get here, they've, they've just come out of the Grand Canyon, they're like, <laughs> so uh, at 7,000 feet, we need to provide them something to eat and a place to, to lay their eggs and so the next generation can go on to Mexico. So that all really was the genius and the brainstorm of my sister Pamela, whose garden you'll see next. This is the mother garden. She started it um, because she loves insects, particularly butterflies. And when she was living in California, she didn't have to think about providing food for them. It was just there. But when she moved here, she realized that she was going to have to make some special effort to get those butterflies to come to the yard. And that's how she fell in love with native plants. And that's why there's native plants here. It's I love them. We love walking around them. They're beautiful. They're green and happy and glorious, but they're really for the insects.
So let me add this on the side. This is a showy milkweed. You can see it's infested right now by aphids, and I'm, I've been doing neem oil in the evenings. Yeah, you aphids know, seem and to really love the milkweed. They love the milkweed. These, like yellow aphids. Mm -hmm. I've seen them all over them this year. And yet, they've been on them every year for four years. These were planted in 2018, and then kind of built the hill around them later. But um, every year the aphids come, and every year this showy milkweed gets bigger. It hasn't bloomed yet, but it's going to. Look at this. It's all milkweed. Wonderful. This is the neon sign. Monarchs, <laughs> come here. Then all this lichen rock um, I got because I have a, had a wilding permit that was acquired by the the arborist and naturalist who, uh, plant expert, Christy Sorrell, so without whom this garden could not now. Um, she got wilding permit for us. We went out into the national forest to the designated area for collecting rocks. And we collected two pickup trucks and a trailer full of these lichen covered rocks. And there, this lichen is in bloom. It's super healthy. You can see all these petals and some of the ones on the other side are even more glorious. It's just amazing. All the different colors, it's, just, it's alive. So now, see so here's this room too. Now I have a lichen jungle too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I think people underappreciate the importance of lichen in our right. ecosystem. It's really important thing. Yeah, it's really all part cool. of the system. And I think too, rocks mixed with the soil create that little micro habitat for your plants so you can have you know a shasta daisy on this side because it just gets just enough sun right next to this little blue stem that's loving life and you can make your plants you could well when you walk in the woods just notice those lava flows of beautiful rock and take especially this year after the monsoons there's so many plants growing out of them that's what we want this to look like because that's what the creatures need and we need the creatures. It's a system. So then the backyard really is where it all started, and I'll take you down to the bottom. The one, two one. Colorado. And just in, until May, this was all flat, right? And that's our deck, the hot tub, and this was the least attractive of all the gardens. And so, the, again, this past spring, we put, popped out, I say we, Christy, <laughs> popped out the plants that could be moved, transplanted safely. Those ones over there couldn't be, that's the valley. And then we just brought in more of that composted mule manure from the Grand Canyon and some more OGC and rock and created a little terrain. And then we put those plants back in and added a few more. And I'm, I'm super, super proud of this rice grass because this has been here since the beginning. Right. That's awesome. Since 2017 when we planted the plateau. Yeah, rice grass is also so hard to get to germinate, so it's such a special plant Isn't it? when you've got I have it. Two. Nice. <laughs> so I like to think about the pollinators going back and forth and pollinating them. And so the seeds I learned do not germinate for seven years. Yeah. Seven years. They take their time. They do. So I fear I've got what, three more years to go, and then maybe we'll maybe see more. some big yeah. ones popping up. <laughs> so I am growing one food, a pumpkin, because I think they're cheerful and fun, yeah. and I'm hoping I can send that vine down the hill and mm -hmm. help, help hold things together. Um, but yeah, elevation and having different, you know, popping things up and getting little nooks and crannies for the plants to grow just like they would out in the forest, I think has been the key to a lot of success here. That and Christy and some trial and error. <laughs> yeah, there's always some of that. <laughs> so, and look, here's the little castellica that I got from you. It's still alive. I made its own little castle. Don't step on my castellica. <laughs> and our, our grandma grass, friendly grandma this year. So I got some little, I call them eyebrows. When we were children, we used to love playing with these. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I remember using them as like rings when mm -hmm. we were kids. Mm -hmm. And yeah. little fake eyebrows. Little, yeah. yeah. Good times. Silliness. Yeah. Super fun. But this all began. Let's, well, let's go this way. So there was an electrical line that ran from the house down to the bottom of the hill, and you could, you could reach it. And then just below it, there was a natural gas pipeline that ran on the surface of the hill, down to the bottom of the hill, and you could stand on it. 
So my mother wanted to have a, a bigger deck. All she had was this little tiny space up here. And the rest of this was just wildlands. Red cinder, crazy weeds. The oaks were here, but they'd been trimmed back every year to keep them away from the electrical line. That's why there's a tunnel down the middle. Yeah. So Pamela, genius that she is, talking to the contractor. Look, there's a squirrel. Oh, it looks like he's after your bird feeder yet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, so we buried those under 18 inches and then brought in again more uh, rock and soil. But we didn't know about the composted mule manure yet. So this down here was not built with magic dirt. This is built with everyday ordinary fill dirt. But it's still fine. It works. It's just not as lush. And we didn't know about creating elevations, right? So we call this the plateau. It's just flat, right? Like, like people used to do in Flagstaff back in the 70s or the 50s. They'd come back here and they'd cut down all the oaks and try to make a flat lawn. That's what they wanted. We were lucky nobody ever cut these oaks down, except for the ones touching the power line. Mm -hmm. So now they're kind of growing back. Yeah, and that's this wonderful. Green tunnel, which is really fun. Yeah, our native oaks are so slow growing. So whenever I see someone who's got one that's like nice and big in their yard, I'm always, you know, I'm a little jealous. So well, it's we, nice to see. Well, we know that we're really lucky to have this oak forest in our backyard. Mm -hmm. So we didn't have to plant that. That was here. After we did this huge disturbance, we did get an infestation of chagas bugs, which also I think are called kissing bugs, and they're not native, okay. and they're very bad and they, I guess, dwell underground for quite a while. And they came out after all this disturbance happened and they really hurt the oaks, which came back. They love to taste the tender, juicy tips of all the green, delicious plants. So you come out and see the top of all the Arizona grape would just be shriveled up and brown, mm. all the little new growth, it was awful. And so we would go on chagas hunts with long, long like medical tweezers, you know, catch them squish them, put them in a jar, <laughs> shut it down. So that, after two years, the second year they came back, but not as badly. The third year we didn't see many, and this year none. Nice. So this we did, into, planted in 2017. So this is four years old. Nice, it looks great. Thank you. So back here, um, we had the mother datura of the datura that's in Pamela's yard, which you'll see later. And then it went away wasn't here at all last year and now it's back mm -hmm. so they have their ways yeah i see Wait, yeah they are patient right and then over here yeah. but there were none last year and I'm, i don't think they'll bloom this year but that's okay they're patient yeah. we're patient they'll be back yeah i think that's right. the thing that most people have to realize is like you can't i mean you can go and try and fill your garden out when you first plant it but everything will be way too close together within a couple of years and then you'll be editing exactly is, and yeah. it's just nicer to go ahead and plant things at an appropriate distance apart and you'll just have to be patient and give it a few years mm -hmm. and then it'll fill in i'm going to do that with people. everything but the ground cover yeah I'm greedy for the ground cover i get that I'm looking for more woolly time I get that. <laughs> i'm I on get a hunt that. So these Maximilian sunflowers are genius. They just, they're so beautiful. But they come later. And that's the other thing about a native garden is that you're, you're only going to have one or two things in bloom at a time. And they're special and we love them. And we don't worry about not having an abundance of color all over the garden because we know that something's coming. As long as you always have something in bloom for the whole season. So you put your early valerian in and then your late maximilians so that you can maximize the season for the pollinators. Um, and just appreciate every little special thing that comes along. They're not gonna be the glorious rhododendrons of back east. You're not gonna get azaleas and you can't do hydrangeas here without wasting a lot of precious water. Yeah. And never being happy with them. They will not be happy. <laughs> should really yeah. plant the happy plants. Right, yeah, no, I know a lot of folks who move to Flagstaff and they, they can keep certain things alive, but the amount of labor that you have to put into it versus the payoff mm -hmm. doesn't seem real worth it to me in general. Mm -hmm. But I mean, to each their own. But it's kind of about reframing though. I think because so. Because I did live back east for 30 years. It is glorious, everything grows, it's wonderful. 
Um, and it is just about reframing your lens and, and finding different right. Appreciating view. when things are just green, even if they aren't blooming. As right. green as a blessing here. All right. On so for own. the garden tour, like one thing here and one thing over there, I'm like, this is the native garden. Yeah. Welcome. But look at all these things flying around us. We're just surrounded by little flying pollinators. It's awesome. Mm. All right. All right, so we can go um, back out this way, and this is down here. So the next project, a friend of mine who um, uh, works for Forest Service and is an expert in trail building and you know maximizing recreational value of a land, this land, she is going to help me make a mark out and create a woodlands trail, switch backing down to that bottom corner there because. From that corner, I have an unobstructed view of Mount Eldon, oh, which turns nice. pink at sunset. Yeah. So, um, so we'll do that eventually. I'm going to keep it wild. It's not going to be uh, as, as organized, but I want it to be mindful so that I can get down there and have a cocktail at sunset, and then traipse along the bottom, and then back up to the you know hikers amongst us. So nice. That'll be fun. And then I'm thinking hammocks meditation bench, and some seating down there for friends and cocktails. <laughs> it's never over. I'm never going to be done. Right. It is, that is kind of the thing about gardening, I feel mm -hmm. like, is you're, you can right. always make improvements. You can always make things. Or find a, a rare plant. Or, yeah. Um, right. Something that's got an unusual color that you don't have. Right. Or, um, you know, that blooms in a season that you don't have a lot of other things blooming. That's really the trick. So, mm -hmm. Like I said, you always want something in bloom. And really, I don't know very much about pollinator gardens. This is all information I gleaned from my sister who's taken all the classes at Willow Bend and through the museum and what else, and Arboretum, of course. So, you know, I've really benefited from, from her knowledge. She's really way more up on this than I am. Well, so the last thing I'll tell you just about this back garden here. I brought all the bird feeders to the backyard. So that one used to be in the front yard because we like to sit in the living room and watch the birds. But this summer, there was a bear that came oh into the yard and it bent that pole all the way down, it just knocked it to the ground and ate all the seed and, you know, looked at my sister was here. I was out of town, so my sister was here, looked at her through the window. And so after some consideration, I decided all food for the animals needs to go in the backyard unless it's a flower or a berry. That's right. Right, because this is just like a shining neon invitation to trouble. Yeah. And so all the food's back here. So anyway, this has become this wildlife grotto back here. So we have acorn woodpeckers, flickers, Harry's woodpecker, of course, Stellar's jay, uh, both kinds of gross beak, um, all the flickers, all the little, you know, lesser goldfinch. And they all come here and the hummingbirds. And it's just, everybody gets along and they all eat. It's like, you know, the cafeteria. It's really fun. So we don't get to sit in the front room and watch as many birds, but we just come out here and do it. So it's pretty fun. Nice. It's a wild kingdom. <laughs> we call it the bird show. <laughs> you know, especially during COVID. Oh my goodness. You know, it's better. There's no movies. There's no going out. There's no dinners out. There are no parties. It's the birds, the animals, the plants. So I have to say, you know, as as tragically horrible as COVID has been, moves people around the globe and continues to be. And um, I think for me, you know, one one gift back was um, having the the time and the interest and the passion and just that moment to look around my space and say, well, so I can't go out there safely, so how can I make this space better for mom, I'm just 88, for me, for our little family pod, how can we make this a more pleasant place to be? And so, you know, I'm really grateful that we had that opportunity and I'm really grateful that my mom was, um, you know, willing and able to, to sponsor that because it was a lot of work and it was, um, you know, doing it all at once like that is expensive all at once. So I think the way to make it happen in a more affordable way, um, if you don't have the opportunity to do it all at once, um, and actually we didn't, we had, that was 2017, this started in 2018 with sewer pipe breaking, 
and then we finished it in 21. So really it was over a period of four years. But nevertheless, you can do a small rock garden. You know, you can just put in a one bulb and some rocks and a few native plants. And if you use that magic, magic dirt and I think the OGC, the rocks and some water, gentle water when you're young, um, you can create a little native oasis in your yard in Flagstaff. And once it's established, you only have to water it when it's, you know, not raining once a week for maybe 20, 30 minutes and you're done. So, you know, to me, the benefit, not just in the peacefulness and the, the sense of um, beauty in my yard, but also knowing that I'm doing the right thing for the world, right? Helping the pollinators, helping to create a habitat for them, as well as to propagate native plants, but also doing, you know, doing it in a way that is mindful about our desert lands and the black water that we live with every day. Thanks. This is sort of like the, the nursery zone, this valerian, all these things that like sort of more moist environments. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that that's something that I've found like starting to grow native things for folks is like a lot of the showier nice native things have a tendency to be the kinds of things that require a little more water okay. though. That you'd find in a more of a valley, right. protected area, right. canyony, you know. Yeah, like, riparian areas. These and, walls, they're having this fence in these walls. It really get that kind of like a you know, heat from one side, but shade at the same time. Mm -hmm. And they seem to really like that. Yeah, it seems like mo not all, but a lot of native plants require a little bit of shade in order mm -hmm. to like really thrive. A little bit of a break. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah sun's yeah. intense. And then uh, the Daytour are just doing, doing crazy and they seem to really like it here. So last year, um, their first year, I cut off all their seed pods, you know, these there's some giant one over here. Yeah, the little spiny guys. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, put a box there and then I use clippers to clip them so I don't have to touch anything and to try to get them to not propagate anymore. Oh, because you Cause want I, to I don't want any more. Yeah. But these are so pretty. The purple ones are so pretty. Mm -hmm. I'll save their seeds for, to share with other people. Yeah. This is my most proud moment, my Castilea. Oh, it's blooming. Paintbrush. Mm -hmm. Very nice. And I bought a bunch from you and put them in other places to try to see what you know what what they like mm -hmm. where they're gonna thrive and this one seems to be doing fine here but um, I've got another one up here I just sort of have them like sprinkled around in different environments to see what they're gonna like the most mm -hmm. yeah I do that with my plants as well in containers mm -hmm. where it's like I'll transplant a bunch of them and then I'll Put, I'll put, you know, leave some in the greenhouse, take some outside and just see what they prefer after they transplant. So that's, that's always a good idea. I never thought of doing that, moving the plants while they're still in pots to see how they do in yeah. different environments. Well, since I've got so many container plants, mm -hmm. that I, for me, it's like, you know, if I have 20 of something, I can put five here, and five oh, there, right. five see. somewhere else. Yeah. So, and that kind of is a way to experiment a little bit. Now over here, I just tried to make this as wild as I could. It's just full of rocks and stuff and sort of inaccessible to people unless you're really committed. Mm -hmm. And that's where all my milkweeds are. Mm -hmm. Most of my nice. milkweeds, I have all the five different yeah, kinds of milkweeds that grow in Flagstaff. Very cool. Back in there. Yeah, and I'll, I'll kind of show folks. So this is like, this is a waterway that comes off of a, water comes off of your roof. Well, this is nice for folks who, for folks who either don't want rain barrels or, mm -hmm. or are just trying to go like a more natural. You know, route. rain barrels weren't really working for me because I'm so flat. I don't have enough elevation to take the water anywhere. Okay. Yeah. Just effectively. And also I don't have much room to store water. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you get all your water at the, during the monsoon, but when you really want to use it is like, is September, October, mm -hmm. and you just can't, I can't store enough to do that. So I took a class at Warner's in water banking, and this is the idea that you try to give the water a place to go and then stop and sink. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I've got it going back here with all this dirt back here, so hopefully it will sink and absorb. Mm -hmm. Because I only have about 20 inches before I hit the bedrock of the lava flow oh, okay. underneath me. Mm -hmm. So I, there's, not, there's not much for it to, you know, the water doesn't have very much 
space to fill. Mm -hmm. So that so. I mean, that's another good argument for the strategy you guys are mm -hmm. using, where you're doing the mounding. Yeah, I to had provide to provide that soil. Yeah, that's yeah. a really good idea because I also know I couldn't go down. <laughs> yeah, I have a friend out in Mountain Dell, and she's on limestone, and she's like, "There's no topsoil." So mm -hmm. this is this is a really great strategy for mm -hmm. people who want to. It's have. a little odd, but I like it. Yeah, I like I like the texture. I like textured yeah. landscapes. And because I was, you know, fortunate enough to have this rock wall around two sides, mm -hmm. that made it a lot. You know, it's a lot easier to push dirt up against a rock wall than to make a freestanding. Right. You, know, you only need one side of, of rocks to brick come in. Right. Otherwise, it's an awful lot of rocks to collect and For sure. or buy or whatever to mm -hmm. put around. Mm -hmm. I happen to love rocks, so I don't mind seeing a lot of rocks. <laughs> <laughs> so the original plan was to um, at, at Laura's place was, you know, when I had to do this construction was to put in something for butterflies for, and that was really what I was all about because mm -hmm. I was really into butterflies before and I'm never much of a gardener but I had to learn how to grow butterfly food so that's what the that's what I was that's what I've learned in the last five years very cool so yeah and then many of the plants that are here were taken as babies from from Laura's place okay. last year so like all everything that you see that's big came as a little baby um you know sprout from that house very cool. last year yeah and then I filled in with things from your place and from the Arboretum and Judy Springer while she was still here mm -hmm. I bought stuff from her so before she moved to New Mexico yeah now I'm also hoping to get a entirely green wall so I've got five climbers I've got honeysuckle um, Arizona grape clematis Virginia creeper and what's the other one pops oh nice wild hops yeah mm -hmm. I just and I think did I get that from you I don't, I know that I sell wild hops. I'm not sure if you got it from me or not. I don't remember if I bought that from you. Yeah, I, I mean. It's been too long. You know what? I know I didn't because it came from Verdi. It oh, came okay. from Verdi Growers. Okay, yeah. Do yeah, you know if it, is it Christy like. Christy got it. And it's a common hop, so like a wild um, hop? Or? She calls it an Arizona hop, so I think it's a native. Okay, yeah, that yeah. should be the, yeah. Yeah. So I'm hoping to eventually just have all green walls. So I, um, I'm kind of putting all those things different places to try to see where they like take off be, yeah, yeah. Nice. and I'm trying to propagate grapes by taking the little tiny bitty baby cuttings off the end and put them in water and two of them have roots now nice I feel so powerful <laughs> <laughs> and then I also took down some some big dead um, trees or dying trees and so I put in these two pinyons thinking that you know it's only gonna get hotter and drier let's see how they do here yeah also I love bluebirds and bluebirds really like pinyons so I'm hoping that they will attract bluebirds once they have, have pinions on them. And then I took out a, a bad, a, a not native and not healthy oak over there and put in the, the gamble oak nice. instead. And then I put in this maple. And um, so the things that are doing the best here, like this four o'clock has found its niche. It's found its, oh, its yeah. space that it wow, loves. Wow, that's a beautiful And it just is making babies like crazy. You I can bet. see how many babies it has. I've already been scooping up babies uh -huh. because they'll just like be right in this very narrow pathway, so they have to move. Let's see here some more. Now I've got more babies coming. Nice. All these little baby four o'clocks. Yeah, I've I've seen only a few of them out in the wild that are this large, but it's always a treat when you come across them. They're beautiful. I think I'm probably gonna have to take out this detour because it's trying to eat my four o'clock. <sighs> you know, Competing a little bit for yeah. sure. Yeah. But. But it's, it's really hard for me to take anything away still. I'm yeah. still in the mode of more is better, as many as you can. And, right. you know, you can see that I was sort of greedy and put things really close together. And now I'm having to take things out because they're too close together yeah. as things get bigger. We were kind of talking about that <laughs> before. It was like, it's difficult to, like, not have, like, the instant gratification of everything looking still full. Up. <laughs> yeah. So it is yeah. like, yeah. Like there's this cacophony over there between the sage and the... You know all these things that are happening over there that yeah well and sometimes you don't know how well something is gonna do so you put it mm -hmm. in and then it's like Completely. it does real well <laughs> right like this guy yeah you know that's just it's just a really happy spot for it yeah he really I, likes it there between the wall i'm guessing and the, the rock and yeah they seem to it's one of those plants that seems to really like being in rocky spaces mm -hmm. like and cascading down it looks so good mm -hmm. and i feel yeah. like you know, it's so dramatic to watch it go from nothing, you know, in the spring when the snow finally melts, mm -hmm. especially back here. This takes a long time to melt back here because mm -hmm. um, of the fence. And so 
when it's all just brown and nothing. And then all of a sudden it starts to go and then it gets that big. It's just so spectacular. It's mm -hmm. exciting. I think it's much more fun to plant things that are natives like because of that, yeah. because you get to see this whole, like what's coming up this year, mm -hmm. you know, and like at Laura's place over the, it's been since 17, we've seen some things do really well some years and some things, and then kind of go into, you know, dormancy and then other things do really well. Like she had that sunset crater penstemon that was just enormous. And then it just sort of failed. Mm. Yeah. So it was weird, but it was doing great. It was making babies. All mine came from there. Mm -hmm. And they were, they're fine. Like that sunset crater penstemon over there. Look at how tall it is. It's enormous. Oh my goodness. Isn't it huge? Yes. Here, I let's am. see if I can get a... Uh, go take it's a look at it. Large. Yeah, people. It's kind of a freak. Hey, it's always it's always nice when the native stuff you give it a little bit of extra love and they just get nice and big. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, so beautiful. I'm just letting, hoping that you know, waiting for all these to cure, to harvest the seeds. Mm -hmm. That's another thing about growing a native garden is you don't have to deadhead anything. It's really nice. <laughs> yeah, you, know? you just <laughs> so want to keep. The I'm seeds. leaving it like yeah. this on purpose because I'm trying to collect seeds. It's a it's a nursery as much as it is, you know, it's mm -hmm. an incubator. Right. This place, yeah. Right, yeah. And then if you don't have all of those like finicky hybrid species or things mm -hmm. that you can't propagate from seed, it's like it's actually worth it to wait for the seed. Mm -hmm. So that's nice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, I've been doing okay with propagating. I've got one year I got, um, I grew a showy milkweed nice. from seed. That was very exciting. I went to the Native Plant Society meeting when some guy had a, you know, a grocery bag full of showy milkweed seeds with all the fluff and everything. Mm -hmm. So I planted 70 and I got one. <laughs> <laughs> they are they are tricky to get going. There yeah, I was really proud of myself though. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I've, I talk a lot with people about the challenges of milkweed propagation. So. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's hard. Um, some of the, I, I bought some antelope horns from you mm -hmm. and um, I planted both of them, one on this side well, on that side, because I'd had these tall poles, you know, like those, you know, big poles for holding up a uh, shade structure. Uh -huh. So I already had the holes. So I just put the the antelope oh, horns. I just I just measured how deep I needed to go from the, nice. you know, from the because they're the long, you know, the long long tube. Yeah, pots, I yeah. measured it and then I kind of just like slid it into the hole because nice. they really don't like their roots touched. Exactly. They really don't yeah. like their roots messed up. I, that's the one thing I really try yeah. and tell every person who buys. Make your hole weed. perfect. Measure it just right and then just slide. Like put it on a trowel and just slide it in. Very Try not good. to touch it at all. Exactly. And make sure it's like the right moisture content when you slide it out of the tube so it doesn't all fall apart. Right. Yeah. I always tell people the water before they transplant. Oh, look at mm -hmm. butterfly. I saw an earlier one over here. I think oh. Queen. And yesterday oh, we saw the goes. Holy Grail. We saw a monarch. Oh wow, that's awesome. And I haven't Laura seen. Laura was here, so she saw it. So you have, you have, a, you have uh -huh. someone else who you can just, corroborate. I can't ever get a picture of them. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, butterflies in general are a little uh -huh. difficult yeah. to photograph, but yeah, no, so it's always my nice. really hot spot. You know, this is my hottest spot, especially because the sun, you know, the late sun really heats that fence. Mm -hmm. So I think things that like heat, you know, are really doing well along here. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that that's something that you definitely have to like learn when you go to a mm -hmm. space. And I definitely am still learning, even though I've lived in the house that I've lived in for most of my life. It's mm -hmm. like you do, there's a bit of trial and error and figuring out like, oh, this spot mm -hmm. is too hot. That spot's too windy. This spot's, mm -hmm. yeah. right. Mm -hmm. Trying to just figure all of mm -hmm. that out. For and where the shade is at what time of year when mm -hmm. things are coming up, mm -hmm. you know, like the valerian comes up really early. So it but the sun's over there at that time. So, you know, mm -hmm. so it's mostly trial and error, but trying to pay a little bit of attention. Right, right. And then I put, I just felt like I should put some, I wanted to put some veggies in. So I put in, um, but I haven't been paying very much attention to them because I've been so focused on the other plants this year. So right. they're not getting as much attention as they did last year. And I'm not having as much success with my tomatoes. It's yeah. It's, it's just fun. It's been a slow year for tomatoes for everyone, from what I understand. It so. was so hot last year that I had the shade structure that I used uh, shade cloth mm -hmm. on a you know pop up frame mm -hmm. and had it over this. And it was about two weeks ago when I finally said, you know, I need to take that down. It's not hot. It's all shady. Yeah. I and mean, it was when we were having all that overcast weather. Mm -hmm. So I finally took it down a little late. They could have stood a more. They could, they would have had another couple of weeks of sun if I hadn't. You know, hadn't I thought of that? 